Awesome. Thank you so much, Anne. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Amanda, and I'm an operations manager at Limit, an intro tech startup. I previously was at Neighbor Schools, which is based in Boston, where I served as the people, te um, people ops team of one. So I know firsthand the need to build processes to scale an efficient people, op people operation. So today for our panel, we have Abby Cohn, who is the director of people operations at Knox Financial. We have Grace Tkach, Senior Director of People and Talent Acquisition at Celsius Therapeutics. We have Christina Wang, who is a Fractional Chief People Officer. And we have Samantha Janchic, who is the Director of People Operations at Nouveau Air. I remember my time as um, a People Ops team of one. We scaled our team from 12 people to 24 in three months three months, which meant that I had to build so many different processes out, like onboarding, performance management, and recruiting. And so, you know, I really wish that I had, that I had this panel a year ago. So i um, super excited for our speakers today. Um, before we jump in, we love questions. So feel free to submit them um, on the far right side of your screen and do direct them at the end um, during the Q&A. We will um, dive into those questions. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Abby. Let me try to share my screen. Can you all hear me okay? Uh-oh. I don't have permission to share my screen. <laughs> Starting off strong. Um Amanda, do you have my, I sent you my slides the other, last night, do you mind sharing mine? Yeah, let me go ahead and see if I can do that for you. Sorry, you guys. Um, I'll introduce myself while we're, we're setting this up. Um, I'm Abby. I'm the director of people operations at Knox Financial. Knox Financial is a Boston-based startup. Um, we are in tech real estate. Our goal is to help you afford to buy your new home while keeping your old home as a smart financial asset. Um, and I've been in the Boston people ops tech world for about five years now. And before that was in the nonprofit space. Um, and I'm going to be talking about tech and efficiency. Thank you for sharing the slides. Um, I just want to start off by saying that being in people ops is hard. We all know that. And being a team of one is even harder. I'm currently a team of one today. And my company, we're about 45 people. Um, and so the Boston people ops community has been my, my saviors. And the people that I reach out to when I need questions or you know, advice or anything like that. So um, I want to say thank you to all of you, my peers out there, and we'll dive in and hopefully this can be a little helpful for someone who's also in, in my shoes. We can pop to the next slide. Oops, there you go. Awesome. So when it comes to efficiency, I really wanted to share out this framework that I found to be really helpful as a team of one. And it really starts out with assessing the current state of, of your business. So what are the big challenges? What are the hurdles that you need to overcome? What are the company goals? And what is leadership trying to accomplish in the next six months to a year? How does that translate then to your people ops goals? And knowing where the business is going and wants to go is the first step in figuring figuring all of this out. What are you going to work on? Where are you going to prioritize your time? From there, um, I created a list of priorities, and this was the one of the best things that I could have done jumping into a people ops organization or a, a company as a team of one. Um, and 
I essentially created this brain dump of everything that I could do, needed to do, wanted to do, and wrote it down. Um, I ranked it then based on priority and aligned that back to the company goals. So, you know, for example, if we needed to hire 15 people in the next six months, I knew that getting an ATS up and running, um, getting a solid hiring process up and running and followed by an onboarding process was going to be really crucial and critical to me getting things done that aligned with the business. The next piece um, was automating and that that really comes from where are the small wins at least first where are the small wins where's the low hanging fruit what can I check off this list that I can either just do once and and check it off or I can set it and forget it. Maybe it's automating an ENPS survey that goes out every six months or simply going into Gmail and setting up email templates so you don't have to recreate the same email over and over again. Really simplifying things for you is, is going to be so huge. Uh, we can pop to the next slide. So next up, getting into the tech. Um, when to purchase tech or simply when to start, start exploring tech tools. And before you even start, a good question to ask is, what do you need your technology to do for you? And how is it going to bring you to the next level? This helps you start to imagine how tools and tech can help you in your day-to-day -day role. And next up, does this tech solve an immediate need? Is it going to make my life easier? Is it going to make my job more efficient? Does it take something off my plate and free up more time to work on something else? And after you identify that, could it potentially also solve for a future need? We just implemented an HRIS a few, um, a few months ago, um, and it also happens to have performance man a performance management tool. It has an ATS. It has ENPS um, capabilities and survey capabilities within it. It checks off a lot of boxes that I, may I didn't need right now, but definitely knew I was going to need in the future. So uh, a key takeaway too is that less systems the better you're going to have to train your employees your employees are going to have to have logins and know how to use each one and less is truly more when it comes to transitioning this over to your employees so once you decided what you need and how the, the next question is how do you evaluate the tech and it starts with being able to identify the growth and scaling ability of the tech. Is this going to scale and adapt to your changing business? We are all in the Boston startup, in the startup world, um, maybe not specific to Boston, but we know that business needs can change in the blink of an eye. And so will this, will this tech, will this tool grow and scale along those business needs, but also the size of your company? Today, I'm 45 people. Will this tool still help me when I'm 100 people, when I'm 500 people? And will it be able to still do what I need it to do? The next is the level of support. And what I mean by this is how will that tech company, that tool, support you through the process? Will they help you with onboarding and training of your employees? Will, they, will that all be on you? How hands-on will they be after it's implemented? What does that beginning process look like? Um, as, you, as you're getting the tool up and running. Next is competitors and references. Do your research. Talk to a few companies. Do as many demos as you can. A lot of companies offer perks and um, some free things if you do demos with them. I've gotten coffee gift cards, lunch gift cards, so bonus there. Um, but definitely talk, um, do as many demos, talk to a bunch of different companies, and then also use your, your network, use your peers, use that, use that Boston People Apps group and ask people what they use and what works for them. Um, and then lastly, negotiate. Um, I guarantee that all of you on this call would give the advice to someone to negotiate a job offer. Um, it's the same thing here. You don't get what you don't ask for. And um, you you should definitely ask. <laughs> awesome. So um, in summary, I've got these five, these four things here, which I think could be a song if, if someone was musical. Um, but it's network, prioritize, automate, and negotiate. And if you remember anything from my, my very quick presentation, it's these four things. And um, the network piece, as a team of one, we all know it could be 
It can be extremely lonely. It can be really stressful. It can be really wonderful and rewarding and, and truly everything in between. Um, and as much as my fiance loves to hear about my work, my work stories, it's really nice to be able to net, to talk to people who understand what we do every day. And I often call on these people to gut check my decisions, get advice and, and really just vent or chat. Um, and it's so, so helpful. So take advantage of your network. Um, the next piece is prioritizing. Not only will this help the business, but it will keep you sane, making sure that you have three things, four things that you're working on and can actually check off will help you feel like you don't have too many hands in one basket um, or too many different baskets, whatever the analogy is there. Um, and then automate. So make it easy on yourself and automate, make templates, do, ever, do everything you need to do to make sure that you get the job done. Um, and then negotiate, uh, again, a great boss that I had really ingrained this into our, our minds. So it's, it's there for me and hopefully I can ingrain it in yours too. But again, you never, you, you don't get what you don't ask for. So definitely negotiate when it comes to tech. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, I remember my times as a people ops team of one and, you know, really having to go through all of these demo calls and being super overwhelmed with, you know, which tech tool to choose. Um, and it was super helpful for me to quickly go into one of the Boston startup people ops Slack groups and be able to ask people for their opinions and their actual use cases of the tech. Um, so really, really connect to that point about networking and um, leaning on your community of people who um, are going through the same um, obstacles as you. Awesome. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Grace, who is going to be chatting about hiring and recruiting. Grace, Grace, I think you might be <laughs> muted. <laughs> Can everyone hear me now? Okay, good morning. Um, I'm Grace Takach. As mentioned, I'm a senior director of people and talent acquisition at Celsius. I'm actually the head of HR, but um, my title really focus, focused on actually acquisition. Um, ironically, though, um, when I started at Celsius, and here's some background information about the company. We're 60, we were like a 34, uh, 35 person biotech company at the time, based in Cambridge in the biotech hub, really early stage. I was the first full-time HR person brought on, and, and so I think that's important to understand. We're Series A, funded by Third Rock, and um, had great, like, a foundation, but really people weren't used to HR. Um, we also had a, have a lot of people that came right out of academia or academic environments, so not a lot of industry knowledge. And so, therefore, with managers, not a ton of experience. I think what they learned on the job was great, but not a lot of formal training with regards to that. So... I think ch telling the story would help put a lot of context into recruiting as a team of one. Um, when I started, again, I was a team of one, but I slowly over the course of time was able to build so that I have now one and a half direct reports uh, focused on HR collectively. Um, when I took the job and it was actually, we actually didn't have any open positions. So I was like, great, my background's recruiting, um, but I wanted to do everything else that comes with a startup. Um, and then a couple, like a month in or something, they're like, hey, you've got eight recs to hire for. So that was going from zero to 200 right away. Again, part of my job was just trying to get people to understand what HR was there for and not just the transactional work. So I literally like walked around the office and tried to get people to know that I existed. Um, we had some process that was light and um, we had very different ownership levels of the recruiting process, um, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, and just fundamental small company growing pains. Everybody was involved and we were starting to feel a little bit more the need to define roles and responsibilities and, and still are in that stage right now. Criteria, I'm not sure what our criteria were for hiring, but um, a lot of times, you know, you heard that they were nice, but, you know, they didn't have these skills. Um, in candidate debriefs. So I think really making, you know, being clear what we were looking for was important. And being in biotech in Boston, as many of you know, super hot market. Um, we had uh, strong science, but not the sexiest. It's not gene therapy that everyone wants to go into. And there's just this uh, lack of qualified candidates. And there's a lot of um, 
salary and title inflation. Um, and our company name wasn't known. I mean, there's so many biotech starting every day that it's like Celsius, what are you the energy drink? No, we're not. Um, and then there was also some aspects of our career ladder, which when we went to post the positions, you know, we would post as RA2, but nobody had a sense of what that was in the career ladder. So it didn't look like a very interesting job. And as a result, we, we really had to rely on recruiters. Um, and this was fine for a while, but when I started, the sense of urgency was increasing. Um, ultimately, what I, what I focused on was, I like to talk about kind of what I focused on trying to do and then also how I did it. Um, as many of you may read, you know, there are a lot of HR best practices out there. And for me, it was trying to drive the stickiness of these practices. So having a robust, consistent and inclusive process. We had candidate seminars and nobody really had guidelines in terms of what the candidates had expected. And we had students coming out of school, people coming from PhD programs. They didn't really know what the seminar was about. So we drafted and created clear guidelines and walked and took time to walk that through with candidates. So they all had like an even playing field. Um, we didn't, we worked to leverage our ATS. Um, we use Greenhouse and uh, LinkedIn. Um, but, you know, as even uh, Amanda shared, you know, technology is great, but without having a great process, I am a firm believer that you, you know, you need to have a process first before you leverage the technology. Otherwise you're just sort of chasing the bells and whistles. Um, anybody in HR probably, you know, can speak to the idea of competencies. I've worked at large companies where you've got like 20 competencies and they choose a bunch of them. Again, we worked with a lot of people that didn't have a lot of concept of uh, HR terminology. So I didn't use the word competency. I was just asking people, what's important to you? You know, I fixated on our core values and I said, you know, what does curiosity mean to you? In the debriefs, I would try to gather the language that our employees were using. And then I would debrief with candidates to see what did they hurt here. And I and had since basically defined the core values um, in actions and behaviors so that now when we interview, we focus on what are the behaviors we're looking for. Um, and that will carry through through all our talent management. Developing a pipeline, I think just really taking the time to understand what we are doing and who our competitors are um, and, and creating those target lists up front because we go back to them now. Um, we spent the time up front to do that, or I did with um, the half person that I had working with me. And uh, that's really important now as things will get even more pressure filled. And a lot of it was education. Um, you know, everything from, you know, I would provide an example of like, hey, this is an email you wanna send out before you interview, which included all competencies, what everybody was looking at. Um, I made sure everybody that was interviewing had an interview primer. I, I spent like one hour with people. It was like a quick down and dirty. I'm gonna do one actually at 10 o'clock today just to you know not take for granted that people know what they're doing in the process because a lot of people would in the debrief you you know you don't want to assume what they know and don't know and and this was also to drive more alignment um our debriefs we made more structured and i even spent some time with the whole interview team educating them on what i was seeing in the market because they're like why aren't we finding candidates and i was transparent in like what we're seeing and everything from the title inflation to the comp inflation and then we talked and we had a session actually and went through like when I go in LinkedIn, like I go to a company and this is what I look for. And then maybe I go down a rabbit hole and look at all the research associates there. But this is how I approach it. And even, you know, here's a template I use to source candidates. And so people wanted that education, which was nice. And, um, you know, they owned the desire to hire someone, but they just didn't know how. And that's what I recognized and I think was important. And in all of this really, um, you know, don't forget about your compensation strategy because what we wanted to make sure was our internal, internal equity maintained without chasing the market. Because again, there's a lot of inflation. Um, and in all of this, you know, kind of really knowing who we were as a company and what our employment brand is. Again, we're not going to be paying at the top of the market, but we're going to offer everything else um, and making sure candidates could feel that during the process and making sure our team was able to articulate a lot of those things. Um, I know I'm probably going over time, just real quick in terms of the how. Um, I'm a big believer in small wins, educating. Um, I resisted the urge a lot to tell people what to do. So I often would ask, just probe and try to coach managers and ask them, well, what do you think that's going to do? Like, how do you think that's going to help? 
And over time, they sort of they've sort of got it and started to internalize it themselves. So by asking these questions and guiding them and giving them some education to sort of make those decisions, I feel like the stickiness was there and the internalization of kind of like what we were doing was really important. Um, have the TA, I had this strategy in mind. I had a sense like when I walked in all the things we needed to do. But again, I resisted the urge to just like throw in HR processes, right? I knew that there was some mindset shift and I had to get people there. So this challenged my patience, but it was and has been really important. Um, everything again from like, when you say curiosity, what does this mean? And, and creating this common language. It's taken a while, but it's it's sticky. And I think, again, I, I never want to be that HR department that says you have to do it this way unless it's a legal risk. Um, and so now I have managers who are actually calling me out on like, well, shouldn't we do this before we do that? And I'm like, absolutely. Um, you've come along, <laughs> you've come along, which is great. So um, again, part, providing managers with information. These are scientists, they're very curious. They've just never been taught some of these things that we grew up with in HR. So sometimes you just have to be really explicit, like, what do you know? Let me share what I know and then repeat and just reinforce. And then where we can formalize the wins, document, oh, here's a process. Here's our seminar guidelines now and, and kind of test and recheck and make sure those things are, are really working. It, it, it goes a long way to put something in writing because both you and the other person really understand and can say like, yeah, that's right or that's not. So um, I know I kind of rushed through that, but hopefully that was uh, helpful for many of you. Um, again, I was fortunate that over time I was able to add to my staff, but um, being the team of one, you know, you really can't do all the recruiting on your own. You really need to rely on your teams and your managers to own it. Um, so thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, the point that really resonated with me was about how you're leading with empathy and making sure that you were, you know, getting people really bought into the process of hiring and recruiting because it can be quite, quite a challenging process as you're as yes, everyone's shaking their head yes, as they know. Um, so really getting that buy in from your team um, is super important in that process. So that's that really resonated with me. Um, and next we have Christina, who's going to be talking about learning and development. So I'll go ahead and pass it over to her. Thank you. Um, great. So happy to be here, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, just a quick uh, little blurb about me. I serve as a fractional head of people to startups, mainly in the tech, CPG, and hospitality industries. I have over 15 years in, people, in the people operations space. Um, a lot of it in the adult learning and development area, um, strategy, finance, and operations. I'm a certified coach from the International Coaching Federation, and I do executive leadership and coaching for entrepreneurs. So learning and development is a critical component of a startup's success and its ability to scale. This area is a key driver of employee engagement and retention, investment Investments here help mitigate potential employee relations issues down the line. And L&D plays a large part in helping to keep costs down if you want to think about uh, investment in the future. So later outside hires are generally more expensive. So if we're saying that employees aren't going, are not staying in our companies because we're not providing L&D, um, they will leave and then you will have to replace them. And the later outside hires are typically more expensive than your earlier startup uh, team. And a robust program will help startups uh, with your employee, employer branding and enhance your recruiting efforts that Grace so eloquently talked about before. So what happens if we don't try to invest time in L&D and we've seen this where employees are saying, I don't care really about uh, comp as much, but I really want to grow in my career. I want to advance in my career. You start seeing people leaving around the 12 to 15 month mark for better opportunities for companies that do invest in this area. And most recently I've seen uh, leavers willing to exit as early as around the nine month mark when they don't see uh, there's a proper plan in place. Additionally, you start to see team dynamic challenges as you uh, grow. So especially when you get to your first 
uh, manager cohort group that you're promoting. Um, basically how you work, how we work and communicate as a team of 10 is really different than a team of 50, 100, 250, and so on. So people don't naturally know uh, the shift and L&D really helps you become aware of these organizational dynamic and changes. Um, and also for your newly promoted managers, they have maybe never led a team before. So you start to see stress and burnout. Um, and then basically when you have managers that are not supported and not trained and uh, helped, they impact your employee experience. So you start to create this vicious cycle of people not having a good employee experience. They're leaving because of their managers, your manager's burning out because they're struggling with their workload. Um, and also you start to see that gap between compensation and career av advancement conversations start to get really awkward. So we'll tell our team, you're on track, you're doing great, you're getting a promotion, but we don't have anything in place to support you in your next steps. So now that I've convinced you in this very short amount of time, uh, where do you start? So a general roadmap to scale is as an HR person of one, I would ruthlessly set aside an hour a week to work on this. And if you have more time, that's so amazing. I personally prioritize Friday morning, uh, one hour to really focus on how do I move the needle on this? The first step, is you have to ensure that your compliance trainings are taken care of. So your harassment training, if you haven't launched that, do it. Um, if you have any sort of industry specific requirements such as cybersecurity or HIPAA or PHI, do it. Um, and then start to bake these into your onboarding process for your newcomers. And I typically love to do this, you know, launch it as part of their orientations. You, know, you start week one, part of your reading, part of your uh, leveling up is to do these uh, train compliance-based trainings so that you get them out of the way and you really don't have to worry about, oh gosh, did we forget this uh, six months, nine months down the road when you're already falling out of compliance with some states. So the next step I would say is when you have time to focus on this, start building out your new manager training program. Um, so first step is figure out what your budget is. So do you have internal, would this be an internal training or external training resources? And some of the topics I would uh, suggest focusing on is self-awareness of a leader. So building out their EQ, learning their leadership style, um, helping them with time management, that's one of the things I hear a lot from new managers, like I have no time, I have no time, I have no time. So let's figure out how to support them in finding quote unquote more time. Um, also a lot of new uh, leaders have trouble or challenges making impactful decisions. I have 15 things on my desk, which one do I go after first? So helping them do this so that they can be in alignment with organizational goals is super important they'll start to need to level up on their presentation skills and have effective communications with their teams. So that's an important area to focus on. And then the favorite is how do I have difficult conversations and how do I receive feedback from my team, from my two, from my peers and my bosses, um, especially if they were in a peer group and now they just become somebody's boss. It's a funny dynamic that they also have to navigate. And finally, intercultural competency um, that Sam's gonna touch on next is super important because you have to be aware of the context in which you are managing your group. So building this part out will really help the organization scale as you go from 50, 10, 50, 100, 250, because you will start to need the management layer in order to make sure that the company are the company is in alignment. So think about um, if you have bonus money, uh, or it's not bonus money, extra money for coaching, uh, money for assessments. People love data. Data help you anchor uh, areas to focus on. And I would bake these things that you're training on this program into performance metrics so that whatever gets measured is important and people can see that this is something that is aligning to the goals of the organization. So focusing on new manager training will give the organization the 
the largest ROI in terms of growth because without great people managers, it's very, very difficult to scale. Um, it's very difficult to organize. It's very difficult to create new systems and processes. So how do you do this? Oh, my wonderful team here has already mentioned enlisted help of others. You can't do this by yourself. So that when in your in your day day to day work, find out if there are managers or employees that actually come to you with training background that love this stuff. Um, leverage them. Ask them for help. I would say explore vendors. Uh, they sometimes they already have pre existing materials that you can roll out pretty quickly. And also talk to your people ops or HR network. Uh, it's super important because doing it by yourself, you don't get the benefits of having that support. So also depending on your employee needs, there's some fast fixes. Um, that's I call this kind of like candy off the shelf. Conferences that you can attend like this one. Um, so you can get so much information. People love hackathons. Also learning in your networking events. And then when you have more targeted needs, look at self-serve learning platforms like Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, things, something that's not super, super expensive, but also gives enough of a context before you can start to build out the more robust program that you want. And if you have money to do individual coaching or team coaching, things, coaching platforms like Sounding Board, BetterUp, they're starting to be more affordable so that um, you can start to scale this as well. And I also want to mention one very important thing for people, Ops of One. Don't forget about your own learning. It's super important. Um, we are always the last ones to help ourselves, but you need to model that model learning and model growth mindset so that it is something that is becomes important to the company's culture. And what you learn, you bring back to the organization tenfold. So don't forget yourself. And then people ask me, well, what does really good look like? Um, and I would say, go check out Acquia's program. It's actually on their website. It's part of their employer branding. I want to give a shout out to Amy Parker and her team of two. Um, don't forget and don't get discouraged. Rome wasn't built in one day. You can't really build out Acquia's program uh, in one day either. So it, I had an extensive conversation with her and it took her about eight years to get to where this offering is. So make sure to just pick off a little bit at a time. Keep, keep moving the needle forward. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Connect with others and we can help each other. This is hard but it is also really exciting. Thank you so much for listening and come find me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, I rem you know, working in a startup, it feels like you're building the plane while also flying in at the same time. And you have so many different priorities. And I have to admit that, um, you know, I really deprioritized L&D because there was just so many other things that, you know, on my to do list. Um, and so I think putting that one hour a week on my calendar is something that I really want to try um, in order, you know, that seems really attainable to like really prioritize that and blocking off that time. Um, awesome. And our final speaker is Sam, who is going to be speaking about DEI. Amazing. Thanks, Amanda. All right. Hey, everyone. I am Sam Janjic. Uh, I am the director of people ops at Nuvaware. We're a digital health startup. We were actually founded in Sweden. We expanded that over to the U.S. last year. And I was brought in. We were about 20 people and the company had never had an org chart, let alone any other of the, the great parts of the people ops functions that, that I uh, the other women here have been speaking about. So excited to chat about, um, as I was building all of this out from scratch, how I thought and intentionally built DEI into every piece of the function. All right, first up, uh, 
let me first, I guess, chat about creating alignment and making sure that DEI is taken seriously, right? Unfortunately, some people see DEI as a nice to have, not a must have. And we know from a number of studies from like Deloitte, McKinsey, et cetera, right? 76% of job seekers say a diverse workforce is important to them. Ethnically diverse companies are 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. Companies with diverse leadership teams see 73% more revenue from innovation and a 33% more likely to outperform on profitability. We have actual tangible concrete data now that we can use to show to our exec team, our CEO, and the rest of our peers that uh, the DEI isn't just a nice to have, it is absolutely critical and important. Um, the framework that I was using as a way to help the rest of our exec team understand and really grasp of why DEI was so important is essentially like this, right? So first, finding the opportunity, like how do we as a company define diversity, culture, and belonging? Um, then making sure that every time we integrated DEI into any part of the business, any part of the people ops functions, I was always tying it back to the business strategy, right? How is doing this going to help the company? grow from new products, uh, new markets, revenue, the patients we're interacting with, and etc. Uh, similar to what a couple of other folks said, right, we are only a team of one, and so there's only so much you can do in the course of the day. And so thinking about building for scale, um, one of our company values is build to learn. Uh, and we set that up really intentionally, because let's be real, nothing is perfect the first time that you do it, right? Uh, the way that I, the approach that I took in building out any of this was do a really solid MVP, get feedback from the team, and then iterate. Uh, when you're building from scale, right, you want to think about, I joined Nuvor at 20 people, is this going to still be uh, manageable and not overly burdensome at 500 people? Like, will costs increase uh, exponentially when we grow from 20 to 100 people? Uh, next up is just resources and needs. So when we think about resources, we often think about budget, headcount, tech tools, et cetera. Similar to what Abby shared of thinking through the pieces of the people ops function you're building and how DEI is tied into that. Thinking about like balancing your people time versus like automating the tech and spending like the capital and, and budgets there. Um, and then most importantly, uh, or one of the most important things, especially when trying to get buy-in from your CEO and the exec team is how are you gonna measure success? What sort of metrics and KPIs will you measure to show like really tangible outcomes? And what does uh, an engaged uh, group, an engaged uh, team across the company look like around DEI? So let's go in to uh, how I actually started. So first and foremost, when I first got to Nouveau I sent out an engagement survey and I made sure to, to include DEI. This is the actual screenshot from our most current engagement survey, right? Uh, I'm a really big believer. People want to tell you what they think, what their thoughts, what their opinions are, so long as you actually do something about it, right? So after we did our first engagement survey, uh, and one, I did that so that I had a basis, like a foundation upon which to measure everything else that I did to be able to show that ROI and the outcomes that from what people ops was doing, because oftentimes it isn't a direct correlation between I'm going to do X and Y will happen immediately. Um, and so, yep. So basically sent out this uh, as our DEI type questions. And what I did at our all hands, which is an all company meeting every Monday, I said specifically this is where we're what, what we should amplify. This is where we're struggling, being really transparent about it. Uh, these are the people ops initiatives that we're going to start right now. And it's specifically because you said X. So tying it directly back to their feedback. So let's dive into a couple of the areas. Um, at a high level, right, folks know that oftentimes we in startups and we as, as HR professionals, we know that the business sees onboarding as a way to get people to productivity ASAP, but we know that there's so much more that goes into that. And so when we think about onboarding and DEI, if we use the, the business case of like the business strategy first, getting people to productivity ASAP, right? We want to create um, a, a, how do I phrase it? We want to create like a foundational knowledge for everyone across the company. This is supports DEI efforts because part of the, the goal of having an inclusive and diverse company is making sure that once you bring on folks, everyone's set up for success. And so we built out a new aware 101 so that everyone knew how the company was founded, what our goals are, how we make money with the patients we serve and so on. Um, 
we also wanted to make sure that we helped people assimilate into our company culture, right? So that's getting people familiar with the various, like for the vernacular, the acronyms, how people like to see feedback. Is it okay to just throw a meeting on someone's calendar, um, et cetera? We also, so since we were founded out of Sweden and we had just expanded to the US and to the UK in the past couple of years, there was a lot of like multi geography and different ways that people looked at and understood diversity across our various countries. And so helping people understand uh, not only the countries that we were in, but the nationalities within those countries was, was super important. Um, we did other things. So like helping folks who maybe like struggle with anxiety and things like this, right? We helped set upfront expectations during the onboarding process of this is what's going to happen at this point. So sending a new hire email of this is what your first day will look like, your first week will look like. It also, to be quite frank, helps keep them engaged to, to Grace's point, right? It's a tough candidate market as, as we all know. Um, and then finally with onboarding, right? Just sharing information in multiple formats. It's available 24 seven. So uh, for new hires coming in, we created an onboarding command center with all of the things they need to do on their first day, all the sessions that they would be going through for onboarding and so on. Uh, we had a number of live interactions, so live trainings with members of our leadership team, and then also this training repository with the slide deck and a recording of each of those sessions. And then all of the various ways that we, through the engagement survey and others of, of how we're measuring success. Next up is talent management. Um, again, right, the way that the business historically looks at talent management, there's so much more that goes into it. A couple of things in particular that I that we built out. So um, one of the most important things with talent management, I think, is having objectionable or objective and very consistent uh, functions and, and processes, right? So in performance reviews and career tracking in particular, I thought about this. Um, we want to, in performance reviews, we wanted to balance like the quantitative and the qualitative measures of how we evaluate performance, what great looks like, and alignment or amplification of our company values. So we built out a lot of things. We use Lattice as our, our tool for performance reviews and, and, other, uh, and other like three uh, sending kudos around to, to folks and, and setting up OKRs and such. Um, we also thought a lot about like, why, why do we do performance reviews? What, what do we want out of it? Right. So we did a lot of uh, training for managers on their, their own bias, how to prevent their own bias, of how, uh, how it may come into play with performance reviews and helping folks build their careers. Um, for career progression frameworks, again, like we wanted really consistent uh, competencies. And so we built out a number of company-wide competencies as well as role specific that's applied to every single person in that career track. Um, again, we use Lattice for this. And so it's very clear to anyone um, what where they're at right now and where they want to get to so that you, their managers and, and their direct reports are able to have really uh, clear and concise uh, and objective conversations of what, what it takes to get to the next level. Um, a lot of this, again, is really important in terms of retaining diverse talent, right? Everyone wants to understand how to grow and uh, and frequent and transparent conversations of, of this is, is incredibly helpful. Um, and also, to be quite frank, there's a lot of talk right now about uh, the differences in career opportunities or just recognition for remote versus in uh, in office workers. And so we're finding that having these really clear and consistent uh, metrics for success is has been helpful there. Up next is comp and benefits. Uh, so again, right, there's so much more that goes into it than just balancing cash flow as the startup with limited funding. A couple of things that we thought about. So I think, honestly, the biggest and most important thing that we set uh, expectations with across the entire company up front, and to be quite frankly, that, that we still struggle with even today, is talking about equitable, not equal total compensation package packages. And this is really important um, in the lens of, of our like three main hubs, Sweden, the UK, and the US, for example. Um, in Sweden, folks, it is folks legally have the right to up to 18 months between the two partners who have or adopt a child for parental leave. There's no way that we could match that here in the U.S., right? So there's no way that we could create an exactly equal uh, total compensation and benefits package across the U.S. And, and Sweden. There's obviously a number of other things that go into that, but just as one example of uh, and of what, what we're thinking about and how we're talking about it. Um, also just having and creating like really clear uh, bonus and commission structures that that 
uh, incentivize the right behaviors and recognize the right behaviors. Um, and then same thing with equity, right? We want to make sure that all people, uh, regardless of how much experience they've had, right, a lot of diverse populations haven't had as much experience or reap the reward of potential uh equity from from an exit. And so it's in our best interest to make sure that everyone really understands uh, equity, what it could turn into one day and how valuable it is. Um, and then really just finally, right, the the PTO and, and uh, flexible work policies, uh, we do unlimited time off. We across the company absolutely have a, a mindset of we hire incredibly smart, capable, motivated, uh, driving folks to come in and do great work. Like, who are we to say what when and how you you can take time off right we um we treat people with respect we we say that if you feel like you need a, a mental health day if you feel like you need to uh if you want to go to your, your kid's soccer game like as long as you're getting your work done into a high quality doesn't matter to us where when how how you work um and then again right just also creating uh different uh policies around parental leave that's all inclusive uh there's many ways that people become parents if that is something that you choose and so recognizing that for everyone uh for recognition go down um we're a really big believer that everyone's responsible for recognition, right? Leaders, managers, and team members, um, and building systems that make it uh, really easy to recognize, but also that make sure that all types of work is recognized is something that we've uh, we've put a big focus on, right? A lot of times recognition is given to those who are high performers. We all know that there's a couple of special people, or it seems that way at a company that that typically frequently tend to get recognized. Um, we also put a lot of emphasis on recognizing invisible work for a lot of emphasis on living our company values. Uh, and one of the ways that we we measure this is through our end of the year awards. We built out uh, end of the year awards where one for each of our five company values, there's one awardee and it's nominated by by their peers. We actually do the nominations twice a year to help reduce recency bias, to make sure that uh, successes from earlier in the year are also uh, incorporated and considered when we choose our, our end of the year uh, awardees. Um, in terms of recognition, we also do a lot in terms of making sure that like cultural differences are recognized. So during all hands, we have uh, folks from our, our various countries that we're in share like these are the holidays that we celebrate. This is why it's important to us just to share that information. We do things like Fika and Learn, which is basically like a lunch and learn, but Fika is, is a Swedish concept. Um, we have ERGs and, and different things like this as well. And then, because I know that I am probably very much over time, I'll go over to, to workplace interactions because I think it it uh, connects with this as well. So um, we've been leveraging various tools like the predictive index, right, to understand what motivates and, um, and, and drives various behaviors with folks to better understand how they make decisions, how they like to see, receive information and such. Um, we've done some work around bias training and to be quite frank, we could probably do a lot more. I think our upcoming all hands, I'll, I'll be running that again. Um, when when we think about multiple geographies, so our three main hubs, there's a lot of things to consider there around putting in place best practices and just like frequently reminding folks people work in different time zones, they have different family commitments, um, understanding like there's different levels of understanding of, of diversity. So like for example, at my last startup, we had an office in, in Argentina and they had never experienced uh, like obviously the the American slavery and so they didn't understand at first uh, the the cultural um, challenge. And, and things like that there. Uh, and so we did a lot of education, right? Meeting people where they're at and doing education first. Um, we help people feel heard by setting up like different uh, culture committees and having them help brainstorm ideas of uh, what, what we should be doing, what we could be doing, giving us feedback on how we're communicating and working with, with our groups. There's a lot of tech that helps you uh, to look at um, job descriptions, memos, et cetera, for like gender, gender neutral language. Um, and there's also, I just learned various slot bots now that'll pop up uh, and say, hey, you could in the future phrase the statement this way to make it more gender neutral or, or something like that. Um, there's some easy things if you do have an in uh, an in office presence of having a room set aside for like a nursing room or a prayer room to be respectful and, and have the appropriate safe space for folks who need to leverage that. Uh, it just it goes it goes on on and on. Um, but basically, for for us, we've tried to build uh, DEI into every 
single component that we do. To be quite frank, we're not perfect at it either. There's a lot more that we could do, but as we know, a, a people of or a team of one, there's there's only so much time in the day. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sam. I was furiously taking notes um, for myself personally and, and just like so, so impressed here about how you've been able to do this as a team of one and really appreciated how you presented those historic mindsets behind onboarding, hiring, talent management, and the shift to a DE DEI lens and how um, those connect to specific um, ROIs. Um, and I think this really helps in terms of being able to manage up to your leadership team. Um, so we have seven minutes left. And with these seven minutes, would love to go ahead and open it up to questions. So our first question here, is how do you evaluate, you know, what are those tools that are most helpful for you all? Um, so I guess we can just do a round robin here. What are those maybe three tech tools that you use on a daily basis? And we can go ahead and start with Christina. Three tech tools that I use on a daily basis, whatever the HRIS is in place, um, whatever the, uh, affordable ATS is and lattice, um, lots of lattice. Abby. Um, I would say an HRIS is huge, um, an, uh, an ATS also huge. And then for us, it's our PEO um, and our benefits and payroll. And Sam? Yeah, so uh, we use Rippling as our HRIS, which to Abby's point includes like PEO. It also includes a lot of L&D and, and things like that. So um, similar to what Abby said, right, trying to keep all of your tech tools, uh, the number of tech tools to a minimum uh, while trying to get as much bang for your buck and as much like resource uh, as possible. Um, we also use Lattice, which does engagement surveys, performance reviews, career tracking and, and OKRs. Uh, and then our ATS we use as, as Lever. And it's nice because all of them integrate with each other uh, so it's it, to everyone's point right fewer people hours and more uh, tech automation is incredibly helpful great and grace um i'll repeat ats and the uh, hris but the other thing i use because we do a lot of co-creation is just share docs um and our confluence kind of intranet page i'm a big believer again in documenting a lot of like the basic things and then really spending time with people on a higher higher value stuff so if they don't know the basics like I, I use our confluence site basically to document and put those that information there so not super high tech but important tech <laughs> awesome. i think for um i think sorry i just want to add one more thing um i think for startups a PEO is so huge, like Insperity and just works in one of those companies because they actually do more than just benefits payroll. They track, you know, PTO, they do L&D, they touch on all these things. And as a startup, you don't have the opportunity to go out and have everything financially speaking. So um, PEOs are an awesome place to start. Great. Awesome. Um, so we have five minutes, four and a half minutes left. Um, and so I know that, you know, we weren't able to get to a ton of questions today. Um, but I know that from my speaking for myself, and I'm sure the rest of the panelists here, if you have, you know, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn um, and ask those follow up questions here. Um, but with our last four minutes, um, I'd love to just go ahead and pass it over to the team. Um, is there anything, um, any other questions that you have or anything else that you'd love to ask? Oh, great. We got another question here. Um, the, the thing that I would end, or I, I would just answer this question again and say the PEOs help me with everything when it comes to labor laws. I do not, I'm not an expert at all. Um, and, and they really help keep me in line. Um, but I would just end and say, uh, again, the networking piece, um, add me on LinkedIn, join the people ops, uh, the Boston people ops Slack channel. Um, I have quarterly check-ins with a bunch of different people. I, I'm so, I, for my sake, um, I would love to do that with more people. So let's network, let's connect, let's help each other when it comes to being a team of one. I would say, don't feel bad if you can't finish everything all at once. You feel like you want to give everything to your organization, but because you're one, it will take more time and that's okay. Be, 
be kind to yourself, but just continue to move the needle forward. Uh, I can share, I think, just um, kind of knowing wh where you want to go and be really patient with yourself and others. You're not going to be able to tackle it along at all, and you have to prioritize ruthlessly. Um, but the more you can also sort of build that sort of like grow your team, even if it's not official HR people, um, build some people within the organization who are going to sing the same stuff you do, and, and, and then that will help. Yeah, and in addition to what everyone else said, um, I think I would add measure everything so that you can show the business that what you're doing is worth the budget, the time, the effort, uh, and then also constantly remind your your teams what it is that you're working on and what's available to them. Uh, there's a current stat, I think, of like you have to tell someone something seven times before they actually remember. Um, and so you may feel like you're you know the broken record, but they they need to hear it over and over again. Great. I think my big takeaway from this is being able to manage up to your leadership and really showing um, those key specific objectives that you're achieving um, with any of the, whether it's recruiting or DEI or L&D. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Anne.